Nicholas, I want to take this opportunity to, to wish you a happy birthday, happy 60th. It's been a wonderful, wonderful experience uh, getting to know you. I've been, as you know, I've been working before with uh, Mike Sefton and Bob Langer, and having to uh, get to know you better and work with you has been, you know, basically the completion of a wonderful trio of mentors that I've had, you know, over my career. Um, you know, I hope that we can continue, and I, I look forward to many more wonderful years of your science and our interactions. Happy 60th birthday, Dr. Pippis. I think you are the most uh, impressive person of my life that inspired me most to come to the BME. And uh, although I, I'm not your student, but I wish that you're your, at any point, I could get your guidance and your wishes are with me. Uh, happy birthday again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come together this evening to celebrate Nicholas Pepper's 60th birthday, we come to you with gratitude in our hearts. We are grateful for many things. This day you've created the breath of life that you've given each of us. The freedom that we enjoy in this great country. And most of all, your grace, your love, and your mercy. We ask for your blessing on everyone here this evening, both, both those who know you and those that do not. May you also bless our time together this evening and the meal that we're about to receive. We pray all these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Uh, we are again, we're all set to get the uh, roast started here. So if you could uh, please set it up. So uh, this, uh, this morning's uh, sessions were uh, supposed to be a technical symposium and a celebration of uh, Nicholas's uh, achievements in science and engineering, which I think uh, we all got to enjoy. And uh, this uh, evening's celebration is also uh, going to be something that I hope we all get to enjoy in a slightly different, uh, uh, different way here. So, uh, Without uh, my ado here, I'm going to get started. I'll give you a little bit of a, a, a format uh, uh, here. So this is going to be done like the Academy Awards. <laughs> the movie that we're going to nominate and award the Oscar to is Nicholas's Life. So basically, you know, there's no suspense here. <laughs> but this also means that we're not going to be here until midnight, right? Because the Oscars usually do go on. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I know uh, there's no teleprompters here. So uh, what we're going to do is this. I'm going to do a monologue first, you know, like they usually do at the Oscars, <laughs> aided by some uh, visuals that uh, have been uh, generously contributed by many of you uh, and many others that are actually not able to be here today. And then uh, I'll follow that up with, uh, I have a few people that have said that they would like to make comments. And they told me that earlier, so I'm going to have uh, you come by and call your names. And then please restrict your comments to about three to four minutes, because really, there's a parking garage issue, of, you know, there's a parking issue here. We have to get done by 10-ish, okay? So I'm not kidding, so that is, that is <laughs> So uh, right around the time, you know, at three minutes, there won't be music coming on, but uh, you'll see me widely waving, so and that means uh, it's time. So. Uh, that's, that's going to be the, the game plan. So uh, one, one of the things we want to start with is, uh, is the date today. You know, it's uh, 080808, August 8, 2008. Uh, this uh, weekend, the second weekend in August, uh, this is pretty special for the Pepper's family. So 1988, same weekend, Pepper's and Lisa got married. 1998, same weekend, we did a surprise 50th birthday party for Pepper's uh, and Lisa uh, in Indianapolis, which uh, Lisa was a very good and accomplished for. <laughs> Here we are, 2008, August 8th. So mark your calendars, 2018, August 8th. We're going to be here. OK, really? This date seems to have some significance. So it looks like uh, we'll be here again for the 70th. And then you can hear all about Tony's post-ups. <laughs> 
he was so, he was so feeling he left out a lot, his post office. Stay, you have it on your calendar, 2018, we'll be here. So, let's see. I am not the only culprit. I am uh, just, you know, I just happen to be here, um, up on the stage. A lot of people have contributed to this, so, uh, you know, the credit or the blame is going to be equally shared. So, 60 years, huh? I don't think I need to say anything more. That was the 50s. 60s, you know, that's uh, a very fashionably dressed uh, debonair looking Nicholas. And more, we'll, we'll get to more debonair stuff later on. <laughs> then we move on to the 70s. This is a very interesting picture. This picture was taken on a Friday evening. Okay? Note Nicholas wearing a tie and a white shirt. You know, this was when he was a graduate student at MIT. He was in his room studying Friday night. I don't know if you can see what he's uh, what he's studying there, but it's a Sham series on partial differential equations <laughs> on a Friday night. Now you know how to finish a PhD in two years. Now we look at the A's. You know, a more 80s look. <laughs> I think he was in Paris at the time of uh, this picture. Of course, in the first two pictures he was in Greece. So we've already covered uh, three countries here. Also very representative of the man. Here's a foreign country. And this was taken in Japan, I believe. And uh, I, I think photoshopped Lisa out of this picture, so I apologize. <laughs> but, you know, Photoshop is a great tool, by the way can do a lot. I think that's how uh, it looks now. So, this is the journey that we're going to go over. And uh, I have about, I don't know, 15 or so slides covering various aspects. So, uh, we'll uh, get started here. All right. What's in the name? So, Nicholas actually has, uh, his publications have various names. Uh, the Greek version of Nicholas, and an Ikeo LAOS, and then uh, his middle initial A, which stands for Athanasiu Pepas. So, uh, you know, I have two 10 month old twins. They usually keep me up at 2 a.m. So, yeah, it was 2 a.m. I was just, you know, trying to put something together. And I said, let me just do some anagramming of his name. <laughs> so, my choices were, you know, the, the Greek version, Nicholas, with the Athanasiu, without. And I said, you know, everybody knows him as Nicholas Peppers, the way it's written there, right? So let's do the anagram, uh, you know, let's do some anagramming here. Right there are some cool websites that you can go to. And... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the other thing I should say is, uh, uh, well, maybe I should take these off. <laughs> you know, roll up my sleeves, take no prisoners. <laughs> So, uh, I'm going to show you some of the uh, more fun anagrams that came out of that uh, website. Though, uh, you can play with this quite a bit, and there are some interesting variations. <laughs> Blind shops. <laughs> you know, there's, there's some science to this. There's some, you know. Uh, by the way, there's something like 73,000 possible combinations. So I have to restrict it to two or three words, uh, not use single words. You know, so I, this is pretty intense research at 2A. Next. And apparently doing that is a bad thing. So there are consequences. All this from Nicholas Peppers. <laughs> and there are a few more that uh, I 
couldn't use today. <laughs> but if Nicholas wants to know what they are, I have them. So uh, this morning, somebody mentioned Dr. Hydrogel. I think that nickname started in Japan. I think one of, uh, when Professor Nagai was teaching in Purdue, he gave a talk and then he referred to Professor Peppers as uh, Dr. Hydrogel. And he's also referred to as Dr. Peppers by a lot of us. And uh, so I was trying to look for some uh, pop culture reference to Nicholas. So here's what I found. <laughs> One can is Dr. Pepper, two cans is Dr. Pepper. And depending on what part of the country you come from, that would be pronounced as Dr. Peppers. <laughs> so, you know, this, this influence not only touched uh, you know, the fields that we talked about this morning, but apparently uh, some pop culture references too. So, moving on. I'm going to show you some pictures here and uh, ask you to uh, you know, help me along here. So what's common between Nicholas and uh, <laughs> recognize her? Body extra work. That's right. So, what's the deal? What's that? They both do modeling. <laughs> Very good. Very good. That's going to be uh, one of the one of the criteria. Fabulous and black. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You're all done. <laughs> One more guess. <laughs> They're both Dr. Hydrogen? Newsletter that uh, Nicholas used to send out, still sends out uh, every year. 
So apparently, this term was coined uh, in earlier than 1979 by Katie Reinhardt, according to Richard, and it was to disagree with this. But Richard apparently had the major role in uh, popularizing uh, the word peppermint. Just in case you didn't know, there's some neat stuff in the uh, second paragraph which uh, I'll not let you read, so I'll uh, let that stay there for a while. You know, people from Peru will recognize uh, some of the faculty uh, names, uh, especially in the polymer and thermal areas, uh, you know, in, in that paragraph. Um, by the way, if you want a copy of these slides, see me after the show. <laughs> now, the Olympics started today, right? In China. So I thought, you know, the Olympics, August the way. So Nicholas has got to be, you know, tied to the Olympics somehow, right? So I tried to see what kind of Olympic, what Olympic sports has he played? Any guesses? What's that? Tennis? Did I hear tennis? Well, there are some, well, I'll show you a few here, and then there were a few sports that I've heard rumors about <laughs> that involved the aqueous phase, <laughs> which uh, I couldn't confirm, so uh, that's not up there. But here we go. Oh, this first one also involves the aqueous phase, but sorry. <laughs> sailing on the Charles River. Now, sailing is an Olympic sport, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Shooting. <laughs> this is a real picture, no Photoshop is used. <laughs> the man with the golden gun. <laughs> All right. <coughs> tennis. Somebody said tennis. You know, Nicholas is right. So to me, that looks like. He just did a sliced backhand. <laughs> if I were Roger Federer, I'd be worried. <laughs> I mean, look at that pose. It's picture perfect. And he's playing doubles, which Roger Federer doesn't play. So I think he's okay for the time being. Any other sports? Well, the next one is a video. And, uh, you know, I want to warn you before, what you're about to see is not suitable for children of all ages. <laughs> so, uh, you have been forewarned. <laughs> this is uh, table tennis, a.k.a. ping pong. Watch carefully. The person on the far side is Nicholas. <laughs> Uh, we had some 
fun stuff there, which uh, some of it involves shooting. <laughs> he didn't hit a thing. <laughs> I don't know about the straight shooter thing. Huh? He just completely missed everything. So, uh, you know, if he invites you to this ranch and now that he's moved to Texas for a pheasant hunt or something, <laughs> I pass. <laughs> based on this performance here, he, he's pretty intense. <laughs> and as he usually is when he's in trying to do something with Yeah, he didn't hit a thing. It's just, you know, all these little cuddly toys sitting there waiting to be grabbed. Just totally missed everything. So, if you get that invite to that, uh, you know, pheasant hunt, you know what to say. Ha! Huh. <laughs> Devil egg is a word that, you know, very aptly describes Nicholas. But apparently this started way back when. It's not just the Nicholas we know. Uh, you know, the, the other, the first time I showed you this picture, it was much smaller and you, know, you couldn't see some of the details. But can you see the confetti at the bottom? Yeah. You know, the man had, had style even then. He was just, you know, this is apparently for some carnival. How many people go dressed to a carnival like this? <laughs> In the 80s. And of course, now this is a pose that you'll see Nicholas you know, doing often. <laughs> so, you know, since he's Mr. Fashion, where does he hang out? Any place where they sell these. <laughs> and by the way, Nicholas, these ties have real DNA on them. I mean, these are DNA ties. I can send you the website. <laughs> There's some pretty neat, uh, neat ties in the, on that website. So where does he like to hang out? This is a real shot of Fighting's basement in Boston. <laughs> which is close now, and you know why. Nicholas just bankrupted him. But that's, you know, he loves to go to Fighting's basement. KNG Men's Mart. <laughs> Just to be a pretty big part of his in Indianapolis. Is it one of Yeah. Why am I even asking? Was that one factor, Nicholas, in your movie? <laughs> KNG Men's Mart. And of course, the millennial favorites. <laughs> uh, yeah. And you know, this but beat me so much when I was in grad school. Nicholas used to call me at 9 o'clock and say, Bala G, there is this absolutely magnificent sale at TJ Maxx. You have to go see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am on my PhD. <laughs> Smoking the lap. 
drinking coffee in the lab. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was the 70s. <laughs> the 70s, what do you care? Right? So let's fast forward to the 80s. You know, Lisa came to the lab in the 80s. And, you know, Lisa is a pretty, uh, you know, practice what you preach kind of person. Oh, speaking of practice, Lisa is the 2008 ASCHE uh, Chemical Engineering Practice Award winner. So we still come to the lab. This is circa '86. No gloves. <laughs> she is running a TGA experiment. What happens in TGA? Stuff comes out. No safety glasses either. Or a lab coat. '87. The associate dean of engineering at, at the University of Iowa. <laughs> Alex Franken, operating a Coulter counter, 1988. Jennifer Salim, working with an FTIR, once again. And finally, 1990. You know, I, I came to the lab in 92. I saw these pictures and said, I've got to do modeling. <laughs> No, we're going to experiments in this lab. <laughs> That's why I did modeling. The experiments I showed you with the magnetic resonance imaging, that was done in Nottingham. You know, you know this is, and you know, I saw this and said back this time, I'm not going to do experiments. So modeling was what I did, and this is the reason but I did modeling. Is that Bell? Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> that is Christy Bell. So, uh, you know, I was kind of wanting to see, you know, how many people would see the light here? We're into the 90s, going on. Finally, <laughs> Look at that! A picture where all the rules are followed. <laughs> this is. Well, it's in the hood and the sash is down. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll pass this. <laughs> but this is when I say, man, you know, this is cool. So now experiments will be done again in the practice lab. So that's when I sent my first undergraduate student to do research with me, to Nicholas Hill Graduate. <laughs> Safety. Okay. Now you know we all made mistakes, and I think I'm making a huge one as we speak here. <laughs> but Nicholas, I think, may be the only chemical engineering professor alive who has worked at two institutions, pretty good institutions, that have worked turned it down first. So he was turned on by Purdue, before he was accepted by Purdue, and he was turned on by UT, before he was accepted by UT. We couldn't get our hands on the Purdue letter, but uh, we have the UT letter. <laughs> you know how these letters are, right? To the point, saying thanks, but no thanks. Well, read it, especially the last sentence. <laughs> like I said, we all made mistakes. That was 1976, and Nicholas started here in 2003. 2003 or 2004? Three. So, what, how long did it take? 27 years. <laughs>
and I was thinking, man, how old was he before? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, people that knew him uh, pre visa and post visa, you know, confirmed that he has hello, which I believe. And then uh, a few years down the road came uh, Aria and Alexi. And apparently, a guy talking to the students here in Texas. I mean, the guy is not recognizable anymore. <laughs> not the, you know, not the Nicholas the Terrible that we knew. <laughs> He's just completely mellow down. Just to give you an example, it was one semester when he decided to have group meetings when I was a grad student at 8 in the morning. Nicholas, by the way, when he was at Purdue, for those of you that don't know, used to live in Indianapolis, which is about 70 miles from Purdue. I'm sure, pretty sure it was a spring semester, so he was driving in you know, cold weather, bad road conditions, uh, 140 miles uh, to and fro every day. So, you know, I'm, I used to show up to work at 11, 12, <laughs> leave at 3, 4 in the morning, because I, you know, I, was, I was a night owl. So, so I told him, he goes, man, 8 a.m., you know, I'm not going to get any sleep. And he said, well, gee, if I can get here at 8 a.m. from Indianapolis, you can come. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's what he used to be, coming at 7 a.m., came before anybody came, leave before, leave after everybody left. You know, he was just, he used to call me sometimes on the road, once he got a phone in his, uh, in his car. <laughs> I don't know if he called that because he had a real question or if he wanted to see if I was still at work. <laughs> and I used to pick up the phone. You know, sometimes I knew, 10 to 11, you know, I have to be the lab because I knew the phone about the phone. <laughs> And then, you know, I uh, had some conversations with some uh, current students and I find out this is, you know, he's no longer, you know, this uh, coming to school early and leaving late time. He used to do this very regularly, by the way. Maybe he still does it occasionally, but... So, you know, I said, man, I've got to test this out. So, Texas and Iowa are in the same time zone, so I call him one day on his cell phone at about 6 p.m. You know, he talks and uh, he's in a hurry, I can see. Because, you know, he's trying to get somewhere, and then he says, Baji, here's where I'm going. <laughs> so, you know, how the mighty fall. You know, 10 p.m. calling me in the lab to see if I'm working, and then 5 p.m. going to see Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> my last slide. Uh, it's actually a beautiful shot uh, of some reflection that Nicholas is doing here apparently. What do you think he's reflecting about? Guesses. Makes sense to be I don't know. Uh, I, I promised not to divulge the source of the picture. Uh, to, you know, so everybody that's sending this stuff will remain anonymous. I'm taking one for the team. <laughs> So, uh, what do you think he's reflecting about? Okay. <laughs> Looks great to me. <laughs> I will uh, read this. It says, Filemu Mulipi Igra. Filemu. So I set out on this mission to find out what is this? What is he? What is Nicholas talking about here? So I knew some great friends of mine that uh, may or may not know Nicholas. So I sent some emails, made some phone calls, and said, "Dude, you know what is this? <laughs> Boy, I really miss the graph. The plot thickens. Now I was really curious." Who grabbed this? I went back to that backhand tennis shot and said, is he thinking of Steffi Graf? And then I realized, Steffi Graf has only one F in her last name. Right? Steffi Graf has only one F. So I said, so it's not Steffi Graf. So I did some more digging up. And you know, by the way, coming up with pictures for this presentation was horribly difficult because of this extensive web page that he has with so many pictures. It was just, I had a horrible time coming up with stuff that, you know, so all I had to do was, you know, take some pictures from his website and put a different context in that. So, anyway, 
So after some significant research, graph was revealed to be
so whenever, and, and whenever we, you know, and, and, and if you want to know about music, history, anything, Nick, Nick knows, you know, he'll know it. And um, so, in fact, you know, I know a lot of people think Google is, you know, Google or Wikipedia, if you want to find things out, that's the place to go. But actually, I don't agree with that. I think actually Nick is the place to go. <laughs> and, and, and along those lines, actually, I remember last year I won some award, and all of a sudden I get this email from one of my uh, former postdocs, Linda Griffith, and she said, Bob, I just heard on the NNN that you won some award. And I said, what, Linda, is, is the NNN? She said, that's the Nick Network News. <laughs> and, and it's true, you know, if you want to know any, I mean, because it's true, if, if something good happens to somebody, all of a sudden an email goes out, probably to everybody in this room, <laughs> probably much of the world, and, and you'll know what's going on in somebody's life. So, so the NNN, I, I think, really surpasses, at least in certain areas, Google, I mean, we can't buy stock in it, but, uh, but it's, it's actually pretty, pretty amazing. Another thing, actually, that um, you know, I, that that actually came up actually as Balaji was talking, and I, I think about this too. Is you know, Nick actually has tried to teach me a number of things over the years, and uh, you know, one of the things that I remember is like he was when we were younger. He said, "Well, Bob, you know, you probably could dress a little better." <laughs> that, that's probably putting it nicely. <laughs> You know, in fact, I, everybody probably that knows me is probably, that I even got tonight quite a few comments, like, how come I'm wearing a coat and tie? And it's true, like my students, I, I have this thing sometimes where once a year I get together with my students and I say, you can ask me any question you want. And almost every year people say, well, how come you never wear a coat and tie? And I said, well, the only time I usually wear a coat and tie is when I was trying to get my small children into private school. Because <laughs> <laughs> they sort of have to do that. But I actually felt in the honor of Nick, I would try to wear a coat and tie tonight. And, and when I, and that's true, when I was a graduate student, I actually had uh, one coat and tie. And the coat, I think, cost about $20. And the tie, I think, was less than a dollar. And, but over the years, you know, largely because of Nick's influence, I kind of did better. And I remember, actually, a number of years after that, I actually had to give a lecture at Purdue. And Nick invited me to stay at his house. And I, by that time, actually was quite proud of myself. I, by that time, I had three ties and um, a couple of sport coats. And I remember staying in Nick's house, and Nick, I, I was in his bedroom, and he opens up this, this closet, which is, I think, bigger than this room. <laughs> and there are, I think, probably over 100 sport coats and I think 500 ties. It was something, and, and I think close to 100 shoes, too. I remember right. But I realized like, it would never be possible to, to do that. But I at least wanted to wear a coat and tie tonight uh, in, in honor of, of Nick. Uh, and you know, and, and, and you know, for me, I, I you know, I, Nick and I share almost everything. You know, I think uh, one of the things I always look forward to is like I drive home from work and I play my voicemail, and Nick and I actually communicate through voicemail or email. But you know, but I always have, and, and it's great. I have this long voicemail. Or her email, and then I know what's going on in the world. At least important things in chemical engineering and stuff like that. And uh, but you know, there's no limit to what what Nick knows and can share. But actually, as I thought about coming here tonight, actually the single you know, I want to share with you all these thoughts. But the single thing that I want to share the most is just what a wonderful, wonderful friend Nick has been. And, and, it's just to me, he really is like a like a brother, and, and always will be. And I uh, I certainly look forward to to uh, 2018 and um, and and you know 8818. But I, I just really want to thank him so much for just being uh, such an incredibly close friend and everything that he's done. Just wish him all the best uh, in all the years to come. So thank you for giving me this opportunity.
Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, happy birthday, Nicholas. And I hope that when I'm finished, I'm still allowed to come to your house tomorrow. <laughs> um, I actually was, was thinking about telling sort of old stories from uh, from Rascal days. I, mean, I think I happen to be in the room here, probably the person who's known Nicholas the longest. Anybody here? Nicholas and I met at a uh, barbecue for new grad students at MIT in early September of 71. And we found out that we were both sort of kind of looking forward to working with Ed Merrill, although well, he hadn't been assigned to us as a supervisor yet. And then we shared uh, desk space and kind of the same courses. It's a pre qualifier time. So I could sort of tell you stories about uh, Nicholas, who's probably fairly unique at MIT. He's probably the only grad student at MIT in all of MIT who wore a suit every day. Cooler. And actually, it was, a, it was a blue suit, a very interesting color of blue. I don't think you can get that blue anymore. Um, and the white turtleneck was how I remember more often than not. It was the 70s. Just in those days. And uh, Nichols, while I was a collector, one of the things I remember was he collected dictionaries. And I think that kind of hit the limit for me when he, when he kind of collected the Serbo Croatian dictionary. Uh, he's probably the only person in this room, maybe the only person in Austin with such a dictionary. <laughs> uh, and he probably still has it hidden yes. somewhere. Yes. And he also had this thing about ties then. But it was a very funny thing about ties. He would actually go up to you if you wore a tie. We didn't wear them often, but we all had one. And you'd turn it over and look at the number of stripes in the back of the tie. <laughs> Nicholas had this impression that the more stripes, it was a better tie. <laughs> But, I mean, one, so I've known Nicholas as long as anybody here, and one of the things, actually, I was a little surprised to learn very recently was that Nicholas trained to be a baritone. And I hadn't realized this, and we shared some emails about this. And so I was uh, very impressed with this, and as a result, I decided to write an opera in Nicholas's honor. Uh, and, and what I have to just do before I sort of start this and read this out, uh, and it may take a little bit more than three minutes when I'm allowed, to provide one disclaimer, and so that everybody in this opera is fictional, and any resemblance to anybody real or imagined is purely coincidental. <laughs> <laughs> so Act 1 takes place in the apartment. As penniless graduate students, Nico gazes out of the window while Bob is playing ping pong. In order to keep warm, they burn the manuscript of Nico's latest paper. And I actually should point out, I'm warning this to Nico, who's probably the only one who kind of knows where this is heading. Uh, but I did change the end. Uh, Michael arrives with food, wine, and money, and he explains the sources of his riches a job at an eccentric Canadian university. The others hardly listen to his tale as they fall ravenously upon the food. Michael interrupts them by whisking the food away and declaring that they will all celebrate his good fortune by going to Cabot's for ice cream instead. <laughs> Cabot still exists. It has a very interesting webpage. And I want you to notice, if you can read it, it's probably a little fuzzy, the item at the bottom, which was the uh, Newton Night Sunday, heaps and heaps of vanilla, strawberry, chocolate, coffee, two quarts. And, and there is a day when we actually did participate in something that I think is probably twice the size of this. <laughs> I think probably when we finished, uh, when Nicholas defended. But they did have some other larger ice creams, and the one at the bottom has 60 pints of ice cream. We didn't do that one, but we came to this. <laughs> While they drink, Ken, the department chair, arrives to collect the rent. They flatter him and fly him with wine. In his drunkenness, he recites his amorous adventures. But when he also declares he is married, they thrust him from the room without the rent payment in comic moral indignation. The rent money is divided for their carousing cats. The other students go out, but Nico remains alone for a moment in order to finish a newspaper article checking the soccer scores, promising to join his friends soon. There's a knock at the door, and Lisa, a model who lives in a flat below, enters. Her electricity has gone out, and she asks if she can borrow a candle. 
She thanks him for the candle, but returns a few seconds later, saying she has lost her key. Nico, eager to spend time with Lisa, finds the key and pockets it, feigning innocence. In two areas, Nico, Che Galita Manina, what a cold little hand, and Lisa's, see me Chiamano Lisa, yes they call me Lisa, they tell each other about their different backgrounds. Impatiently, the waiting friends call Nico. Nico and Lisa leave for Cabot's, and as they leave, they sing of their newfound love. O suave fanatula, O gentle maiden. Act two takes place at, at Cabot's. A great crowd is gathered with street sellers announcing their wares. Chorus, aranci da terri, calvi marone, oranges, dates, hot chestnuts. The friends appear, flush with gaiety, Nico buys Lisa a hat from a vendor. People gossip with friends and bargain with the vendors. The children in the streets clamor to see the wares of the toy seller. The friends enter cabinets. I'm going to now skip the B plot, which is somewhat irrelevant to this particular story. It's involved making fun of an aging government minister, and you can put in whichever name you wish to use for such <laughs> aging government minister. I'm a foreigner in this audience, and I'm probably not allowed to comment. <laughs> Act 3 moves to West Lafayette, Indiana. Students pass through the barriers and enter the university. Amongst them is Lisa. She tries to find Bob, who lives in a little tavern nearby where he paints signs for the innkeeper. She tells him of her hard life with Nico, who has abandoned her that night. <laughs> oh, buon Roberto, aiuto. Oh, good Roberto, help me. Bob tells her that Nico is asleep inside, but he wakes up and comes out looking for Bob. Lisa hides and overhears Nico first telling Bob that he left Lisa because of her coquettishness, but finally confesses that he fears she is disappointed because Nico is unable to get NIH to fund his research. <laughs> Nico, in his poverty, can do little to help Lisa and hopes that his pretended unkindness will inspire her to seek another wealthier advisor. <laughs> Out of kindness towards Lisa, and I gather from the comments this point, it should be happening more often than not. Out of kindness towards Lisa, Bob tries to silence him, but she's already heard all. She reveals her presence, and Nico and Lisa sing of their lost love. They make plans to separate amicably. Lisa sings, Don Belieta Lucy, from here she happily left, but their love for one another is too strong. As a compromise, they agree to remain together until the spring, when Nico can resubmit his proposal and hope that one of his friends is on study section. Act 4. Back in the lab. Bob and Nico are seemingly at work, but both are primarily bemoaning the loss of Lisa. Nico is grumpy without Lisa and driving Bob nuts with his writing about the quality of the last conference he attended. <laughs> they sing a duet. Oh Lisa, to you no torne. Oh Lisa, will you not return? Michael arrives with a frugal meal, an all parody eating a plentiful banquet, dance together and sing. Michael also arrives with news. Lisa, who took up with the dean after leaving Nico in spring, has left her paper. Michael has brought her back to the lab. Lisa, haggard and pale, what happens when you take up with the dean, is assisted into a chair. Nico is still penniless and the friends leave to help him find some money. Bob goes to talk to some VCs while Michael leaves to find his 67 Mustang. Michael sings, Vecchia Bettina, old cop. Left alone, Lisa and Nico recall their past happiness. They sing a duet. So no on back, they have they gone. They relive their first meeting, the candle, the lost key, and to Lisa's delight, Nico presents her with a hat he bought her which he has kept as a souvenir of their love. The others return and promise a tender track position, but it's too late to help their friend. Nico lapses into unconsciousness. He realizes he has no choice but to move to Texas. <laughs> the opera ends as Lisa cries out Nico's name in English and leaves helplessly. <laughs> So next up, uh, we'll have uh, people from Purdue. 
uh, since that's where Nicholas went after MIT. So uh, why don't we start with Ranki? Thank you, Balaji. I really haven't figured on uh, taking a speech here, even with the three, four minutes that I offered to. Um, <coughs> so I'm not thoroughly prepared, but I've had some thoughts in my mind that I've been able to track together. And to be able to say something about Nicholas, who has left a tremendous impression uh, in my mind, after his 27 or so years, and I want to say that this is basically a Purdue reunion for me. And having said that, I think that I should also hastily add a uh, note of congratulations to the University of Texas at Austin. Though they made very good their initial turning him down several years ago with David Helgoff's letter was a lot of revelation. Uh, I'm pleased to see that Nicholas has after coming to the University of Texas in Austin has done superbly in terms of being able to work, be recognized for a lot of the work that he actually did at Purdue. And I'm very pleased to see that the university did so well to work for uh, showing the, the quality of his publications and, and, and recognize him appropriately for it. So I want to say that um, that Nicholas and I have been friends for the last, let's say, 32 years, would that, that be appropriate to say? And um, he had left a deep impression on me. He was um, um, an, um, an incredible, uh, his energy was incredible. He, he was um, one of the best uh, colleagues that we have had in terms of uh, promoting students and trying to get them to, to do the best work they could. And I'm really, really impressed with what he's done at, at Purdue and all these issues. Now, um, I would like to recall some um, relatively um, funny events. Um, okay, I'm still not quite clear about, okay. So we were people of strong opinions, and I have to admit to uh, sparring on few occasions, and people of strong opinions always had uh, something to argue about and so forth. And I, I recall vividly many years ago, we used to have seminars, and I recall sparring with him on various kinds of things connected. One thing that comes to my mind specifically is the one argument that we had in case one and case two diffusion of polymers, and I, I'm sure you remember that. And, and it really got out of hand with students around and, and so forth. <laughs> so um, I recall also the time that uh, Nicholas invited uh, Paul Flory to the department. Fantastic uh, uh, experience to meet with Flory and, and 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 to be and it influenced me tremendously because uh, there were some arguments that followed right after he left and I got involved in the polymer theory and even published a paper. It wasn't with Nicholas, but I, I published with Carruthers. But uh, I want to say that it was all part of the influence that Nicholas had on, on me as he was, and I, I wish that I had been more expressive about the influence that Nicholas has had. As me, as is, he's had always uh, been on various occasions uh, expressed very clearly my influence on him. Uh, okay, now I, I'd like to say that um, Nicholas, when, even when he was very young, uh, I'm talking about when he was less than 30, I believe, probably less than 30. Uh, I recall the time that he once came up to me in the morning and he said, I had a dream. And he said that the dream was I was giving a lecture and Lowell Koppel came in to me with a radio that had an announcement that was made, that, that was being made, 
and he heard the announcement saying that Nicholas Peppers had won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so my reaction was, Nicholas, uh, cool it. I mean, I, I know you're working very hard, so it's fine. <laughs> but now I'm not so sure. I think Nicholas is on a roll. He's not going to stop at anything. You may have to wait until Bob Langer wins the Nobel Prize, <laughs> but I think you're doing fantastically well. I can't think of a worthier colleague than I've had in all of these years. Arvind Varma, would like to say a few words? Primarily, I think three quarters of them 
in the U.S. So this is really a very, very influential individual. And uh, although it's not at Purdue, I see his presence there all the time. And I uh, just wish I had been there before uh, Texas was able to grab him to move here. <laughs> but, uh, but this was not to be. And I think I congratulate, of course, uh, Texas for having uh, brought him here and to, uh, uh, to uh, continue the, uh, the success uh, that he started for you. Of course, uh, I have to thank uh, UT Austin also for hosting a Purdue chemical engineering event this evening. Uh, this is uh, quite an event because uh, here this could be a very nice development event for us. Uh, we have a very large collection of Purdue chemical engineers and they're very distinguished. I want to thank all the organizers for organizing this, and I particularly want to mention about Tony Migos. Tony will be given our Outstanding Chemical Day Award at Purdue University this fall in October, and we look forward to Dr. Tony. So, Nick, I thank you very, very much on behalf of Purdue Chemical Engineering for all the things that you did. I congratulate you, Jay Austin, for having attracted him to come here and for, 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 for uh, permitting him and to foster him the excellent that he has started at Purdue and then he continues really in an explosive manner over here. So we look forward to many more celebrations in the future and to our friendship that has been now for many, many years. Congratulations. Kinnell Park from Purdue. So finish up the Purdue Connections. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kinan Park, and many of you don't know me, but if you don't know me, you do great. <laughs> if you have to know me, it's like uh, knowing Tony Mikos. There's absolutely no benefit to knowing me. Let's <laughs> 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 talk about God Nikos Tempest and the Temple of God. You know, and I, I mentioned Nicholas is not wearing a glove, but he's wrong. I just typed Google Nicholas Tempest. All these pictures, as he showed, he always wears a tie. Even when he does the experiment, he still wears a tie. <laughs> glove. He wears a glove, okay? And this glove is not only a glove, this is a specially designed by Giorgio Armani. <laughs> Best dressed man in science. <laughs> the reason I want to I want you to talk about Nicholas is the one thing that you probably know but not much. Nicholas is the is the only guy, probably the best guy who spend more time to help others. Like NNN is one example. He just talk about other people all the time, try to help them. Let me give you two examples. Thomas Machatz is a great too. He's a, he visited the university to talk about his research and Nicholas, to send me an email one day and said, Kina, show this picture to him. And I just showed to him, he was so excited because he's wearing a scarf of, of showing his uh, soccer team. He, they are crazy about soccer. So he's all of a sudden so happy to see this picture his seminar was fantastic, everything was so smooth. He was so happy when he came back to the grade. He sent me a nice branding, my top the best branding in grade. Probably best in the whole Europe. Somebody told me this metaphor was made from olive oil, not wine. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, another example. Someone came, he's a golfer. You know, he comes to Utah, he won a couple of majors, but he has some heart problem in Athens. He was about to take a plane, he got a heart problem, so he had to go to the hospital. Nicholas was the first guy to know and talk to everybody in the world, and talk to his sister, I think, to send her to the hospital, talk to a partner, and everybody go to the hospital, so just to make sure that someone is okay. So every, he stayed here about two weeks and finally he came back to USA and the open heart surgery is fine. And without Nicholas, probably someone had a much more difficult time. Okay, so 
This is the kind of thing that Nicholas does. He so productive, but I don't know when he has time to do all this thing. It's like a Batman. He knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I see him doing something, he's so beautiful. So I would compare him like a tiger or Jack Nicholas, but he is so perfect. Okay. I consider him like a Jack Nicholas because Jack Nicholas is a perfect gentleman, like Nicholas Pepper. Also, the most important thing is Jack Nicholas set the standard, gold standard of what to do. So for us people like me, all we have to do is just try to mimic him. That will improve you so much. <laughs> we cannot be like him, but I cannot dress like him, but try to be that make your laugh. A uh, lot better person. Now, one day I asked him, Nicholas, you gotta play golf. I play golf, he doesn't. I said, You gotta play golf because you just go out, nice day, enjoy time. And he asked me, How long does it take? So I said, It takes four hours to play around the golf. And he knew, I said, He said, Well, then I have to sacrifice one manuscript. <laughs> so productive. No wonder. So I try to try to be like him. So I want to find out what makes him so good. Why is he always better than others? Always have more fine time to do something much more uh, than we can do. So I try to find that. I thought the reason is for kids from Greece. Nothing allows in India. He was in there, so being in India doesn't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> it, it must be from his, where he's from. So I tried to understand the Greece, and I read the book, The Onion, Our Dumb World. <laughs> By the way, this is a dumb book, don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fantastic dumb book. <laughs> Intellectual like you should not read it, but I read it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, it, it actually talked about even uh, Indiana, as she said, even Texas. The book said, uh, Texas, in Texas, you know what he said? Actually, nobody read it. In Texas, everything sucks bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, the book said that. According to the book, what it says is Greece, Athens, okay? This is the fun part. Greece, 2,500 years past his prime. <laughs> <laughs> this is the dumb way of saying it, but good scientists like you are going to say Greece was ahead of any other country in the world in history of humankind. That's the right way to say it, right? What he's saying here is, ancient Greece was the first place of art, science, democracy, medicine, poetry, and philosophy. Today, however, the nation has more important things to do than <laughs> continue to the advance of human race. <laughs> what other things you have to do with the book? Okay? <laughs> so, I went to the Athens just to understand exactly what makes Greece unique. So this is the top of the of the Greek national flag. And Thomas, do this so many so, so why Nicholas is so good? Okay, here's the answer. Now I took the picture, came outside. I'm going to show you a picture, the zooming in, showing why Nicholas is so good. This is Parthenon. We're zooming in. I'm trying to write a book 
unauthorized autobiography. <laughs> Nicholas didn't give me permission to impress on excellence back to the past. I need to study his God, his God nature. Well, anyway, thank you very much, Nicholas. I have been really fortunate to be in Purdue University when you're there, majority of the time. I uh, really love uh, your style. It's really good. Whenever I see you like you're looking at Kyle, the Jack of the Plain, Okay. So tonight, all the drink is on me, okay? Oh. Simply, they cross all the paper. <laughs>